the NHS as well. Um, we need to think about this, you know, system-wide. Um, they didn't have any view on dementia. We literally had to produce the first ever dementia strategy against the wishes of the department. I always said that we were seeking to bring dementia out of the shadows, and I think we did start that process. But anybody here who knows the number of families that it begins to affect and the crippling effect it has on people, it's incredibly important. I also um, tried to persuade people about the importance of integration of health and social care. And when Darcy was doing all that stuff about reforming the health service, he used to invite me as a sort of hospital consultant along to his sessions with the NHS professionals to talk about this vision. And they sort of all uh, kind of thought, oh, that sounds interesting, but they didn't have a clue. And what I realised pretty soon was that the department didn't want... The, the NHS empire in the Department of Health had very little respect for the mental health, social care, public health whatsoever. The acute NHS was dominant in the department, which then reflects what happens on the ground, obviously. And it was almost, at the beginning, I thought they didn't get it. But then I realised it was willful. And it's all about having power and control over money. And from my point of view, integration is bottom up. I mean, you have all the architecture and wiring between national policy and service delivery, and the, the end result for patients and in terms of frontline staff as well. Um, but you need to start from the ground level. And you, and you talk to patients, you talk to users of services, you talk to families. And what they will tell you is this silo mentality drives them crazy. When people need a system which is on their side, what they often find themselves doing is fighting their way through a system that simply isn't focused around individuals and focused around families. And it was pretty shocking to find that that culture actually existed in the department. And the other thing that I did and in a way this was to give the system a job, if I'm honest, was really push the personal budget agenda. And I very strongly believe in giving patients and users of services maximum control over their own care and support. Personal budgets are only one means of doing that. Let's be very clear about it. They're not a panacea for everybody. Direct payments are a good thing for those people who want them, not everybody wants to run their own small business. Okay, But the principle of maximum control for patients, users and their families, I think should be at the heart of a modern health and social care system. And it, it seems to me that the challenge for us is how we offer support to people to make that real. Because people from um, vulnerable people, it's very, very difficult. So you have to also offer advocacy and other forms of support to enable them to have that maximum control. But it's incredibly uh, important. So anyway, I did that for two and a half years, and I think that we did really begin to shake the system up. And I think within the Labour government at the time, we did raise the status of social care and the importance of it as a public policy issue. Uh, we never got the Treasury to agree to resolve the funding issue, though. And if I'm honest, uh, and this is sort of, you know, the elephant in the room, they didn't want to address the funding issue. So whenever I said we really have to address this, they say, well, let's have a white paper, let's have a consultation process. The reason was, you all know, there's no easy solutions to the cost of the age of elderly society. Either the state pays more, <coughs> the individual pays more, the family, or you have an insurance-based system. Social care, and obviously we don't want that in the NHS, we want that to remain free at the point of use under all circumstances. Social care has always been means-tested, so that interface is a real, real uh, uh, challenge. Uh, just, so that, that, that's a little bit about the background. Very quickly about um, devolution. Well, the first thing is my priority in terms of standing as a candidate is inequality. I mean, my feeling is there has been a real disconnect between growth and social justice across Greater Manchester. There are some parts of Greater Manchester that have prospered over the last 25 years. We're all proud of the renaissance of Manchester as a city. Even those of us that live in Oldham and Bury are, are reasonably proud of that. But for whole communities, frankly, that's irrelevant. And there's a whole range of people who have not been part of that, uh, that growth and that uh, progress. And if we're going to have devolution as a progressive project, because for me, I want to be the Labour Mayor of Greater Manchester, which means a focus on social justice, uh, we must recognise that whether it's pay, uh, whether it's child poverty, uh, whether it's access to opportunities for people from working class communities, whether it's accountability and power for citizens in the context of health and social care, there are far too many people who are not getting a fair deal. Uh, in our in our conurbation. So that is why I'm focusing on inequality. That is at the heart of my uh, campaign. What do I think the challenges are in terms of health and social care? Well, first of all, the £2 billion black hole in the NHS budget. You cannot simply say, over to Greater Manchester, and disregard the pressure this is putting on frontline staff uh, and on services and the impact it's having on patient care. This £2 billion black hole. 
you saw the A&E um, results recently, which showed, I think, three or four of our A&E departments amongst the worst in the country. But the health service and social care system are creaking. And whilst the government talks about protecting NHS funding, we all know the efficiency savings mean that's a nonsense. And equally, social care is being slashed and burned, and has been year after year. And the levy that was... Uh, local authorities are unable to, you know, levy this additional 2%, and that's going to go, no, it's a drop in the ocean in terms of the scale of uh, demand. Privatisation. I am not prepared to collude with the, the current government privatisation and gender in terms of the NHS. If they want us to take full responsibility for this, uh, my view is we have to have much greater level of control over some of those decisions as well. Now, I, I accept this is very, very complicated and difficult because the government has a very clear agenda. Um, but I am not, as a, I would not be as a mayor, be willing to simply lay down and die and collude with that privatisation agenda. A couple of other issues I think we need to be concerned about. Hospital deficits. Who will be responsible in the future when hospitals get into tremendous debt? Will it be the National Health Service? Or will that be a devolved responsibility that Greater Manchester will be expected to sort out? What will happen in terms of pandemics? Mm. Who will be responsible for that? I assume that the government isn't going to leave us in Greater Manchester on our own. But these things need to be, frankly, pretty clear. <coughs> so I think one of the things a new mayor with a new mandate needs to do is negotiate a new fairer deal with government. And I think that some of these issues, uh, we need to go back to government in due course and argue our case in quite a significant way if we're not to be set up to fail. Having said all of that, as Joe said, um, who is, I think, been a, a realistic sceptic, we have the ability to influence the NHS in a way that under the current government we wouldn't have that capacity if, if it wasn't for devolution. Mm -hmm. So we have to try and make the best of it. What does that mean? Well, it means integrate to, to, so that we can uh, have prevention and early intervention. And that means, by the way, it is not just about the NHS acute and primary care integrating with the adult services department of the local authority and forgetting housing, mm. forgetting adult learning, forgetting the voluntary and community sector. It's quite extraordinary that the voluntary and community sector are not round the table mm -hmm. in terms of the strategic uh, discussions that are taking place in terms of health and social care. So if you really want integrate, if you want early intervention and prevention, it has to be the public sector. And I think, you know, workers on the front line of our health service and so are doing an amazing job in impossible circumstances. If you think about the pay, it, particularly in social care, amongst some of the lowest paid uh, staff in our society, and yet we're asking them to work with our parents and our grandparents and, uh, and people who are the most vulnerable, it seems to me that we need to reflect uh, on that. But if you're going to go to prevention and early intervention, it cannot just be about the state. It has to be about community. It has to be about voluntary organisations. And it has to be about the public sector coming together. It can't just be about adult services and acute NHS hospitals and pri uh, NHS uh, primary uh, care. I've said, and I'll, I'll bring things to a close on, on a couple of points and I'll, I'll shut up. I've said that I'm going to take personal lead responsibility for mental health and learning disability. Because I think that what is going on at the front line of our mental health services, particularly right now, is completely a scandal. Uh, it seems to me that the cuts... So mental health was always a Cinderella. We all know that. So what happens is when you have cuts, disproportionate cuts, it's the Cinderella services that suffer the most. At the same time, you have this rhetoric which says we're going to have parity of esteem between mental health and the rest of the health care system. We all around this table desperately want parity of esteem. But it's going in the opposite direction, whether it's CAMS, where actually we made a lot of progress between 97 and 2010, whether it's community-based services. I have a family member at the moment, and the only solution is more and more medication mm -hmm. because the community services on the whole are just creaking at the seams. I find it incredibly difficult uh, to cope. So I am going to take personal responsibility for mental health and learning disability. And those of you who heard about, did you hear, those of you who heard about the Natasha Wise case this week that was focused in the evening news, mm -hmm. about a young woman who committed suicide despite time and time again, um, you know, the concerns that she and her family had being brought to the attention of the services. It is extremely concerning that at the beginning of the 21st century, we don't seem to have made as much progress as we need to when it comes to mental health. And finally, health inequality. Public health, the role of patients, the role of families, recognising that life expectancy in Greater Manchester compared to London and the south east of England, in large parts of Greater Manchester, is totally unacceptable. As Joe said, 
And Zahid said, we have spent decades talking about health inequality. We've talked about the need to reduce it. And one intervention that did, did make a big difference was the smoking ban. Mm. And that was an example of courageous politics. Because we all know not everybody liked that decision. I remember what happened to me when I was knocking on doors in my local uh, community. And, and the guys who, you know, used to go down the pub and smoke. They didn't, it was not a politically popular thing to do initially. But it was absolutely the right thing to do. And it was a very courageous and bold thing to do. Now, it seems to me, whether it's smoking, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sugar, there's a whole range of issues. We need to be braver and bolder. But we also need to recognise that if the health service continues to see itself as being top-down, professionals know, knows best, and does not have a relationship with patients, with families and with communities, which is far more of a partnership relationship. I don't say local authorities are perfect in this regard either, but there is a culture which is slightly better of engaging with the public because of democratic accountability as much as anything else. Um, maybe not as well as always with voluntary and community organisations as, as they should engage. Because I, I believe that you can have a commissioning relationship with organisations at the same time as treating them as partners. And I think what's increasingly been happening is we've have a, we have a contractual <coughs> relationship between um, commissioners and providers in the voluntary sector. And that means somehow you can't work in partnership. I think that's a big, kind of big mistake. So, look, there's lots of, lots of challenges. I think that we have, on balance, got to do two things. We've got to flush out where we're being asked to do the unachievable and we're being set up to fail. And we've got to make the public aware of it because otherwise this could go disastrously wrong. Mm. Equally, though, we have got to show our capacity to be innovators and people who are capable of achieving change, even in difficult circumstances, which is, by the way, what many councils in Greater Manchester are doing. Savage cuts, yes. Protecting the most vulnerable, yes trying to protect frontline staff wherever we can, and not outsourcing and privatising public services, which I don't uh, believe in. But equally, showing to our communities that we can, even in those difficult times, make a difference and improve and support people to have a better, a better quality of life. Thank you very much, Ivan.